thank the Lord for allowing us to be back in the house of God once again. And it's certainly a privilege to be in the place of worship in the presence of the Lord. The Bible said in the presence of the Lord there's fullness of joy and, and his right hand there are certainly pleasures forevermore. And so we thank God because he is there with us. Can the church say amen? And he is our everything. Without him we can do nothing. But with him all things are possible to him that believeth. Our belief in God is integral to our ability, our saints, to be successful in our walk with God. Can the church say amen? And so what a, it's, it's certainly a good thing to uh, be able to, at any point in time, to come into the house of the Lord and to have the Lord talk to us through his word. And it is, a, it is certainly a blessing to know him. As we have been teaching on, uh, starting last week, the subject of Jesus, the Sardine Stone. Let's go now to the book of Revelation as a place to start, to simply to refresh your memory and to get into the meat of our subject. And what we are attempting to do in teaching this is to solidify in your mind the fact that Jesus is the central theme of the scripture. Because in every book of the Bible, Jesus um, is in it. He said in one place, Lo, I come in the volume of the book to do thy will, O it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. So that would indicate, no doubt, that Jesus is in every single book of the Bible. And there's 66 books of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. There are 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. Can the church say amen? And Jesus is represented as a theme as in some way, shape, or form in each one of those books. Or how can I say um, he is in some type of shadow, figure, shade, pattern. In each one of the books of your Bible, he is represented. Can the church say amen? So let's go now to the book of Revelation. We're going to start with verses numbers 1. Um, and read down through verses numbers 3 in the, chapter 4. That is um, where we will stop at. Praise the Lord. When you have it, you can say amen. It says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, saying, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set upon the throne, and he that sat upon the throne, or excuse me, he that, uh, he that set was to look upon as a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow around about the throne, in the sight like unto an emerald. And so what you're reading here, as I explained last week, you're reading the beginning of the hereafter. The hereafter begins with the rapture of the church. This door here that is open in heaven is the rapture of the church. A voice, as he's saying, talking with him, that was, uh, was uh, as it were, a trumpet. This is the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. They that which are alive remain are going to be caught up together with him. That is recorded in the book of, I think it is, 2 Thessalonians, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And so what you're reading here is the rapture of the church. And immediately after the hereafter, you see a throne that was set in heaven. That is the glorified church in which Jesus is ruling over. Can the church say amen? And then he sees um, this one that is sitting upon the throne. He was to look upon as a jasper and a sardine stone. If you know anything about a sardine stone, it is a stone that when light reflects off of it, it gives a different reflection no matter how you look at it. And so if, if I can give you an example, if light reflects off it one way, it gives one type of manifestation. 
If light reflects off it from a different angle, it looks totally different. And so Jesus was to look upon as a jasper and a sardine stone. Now this is all symbolic language. And so what John is doing as he's in the spirit on the Lord's day or the first day of the week or the day in which they worship, um, he is in the spirit, he is full of the spirit, he receives the revelation of Jesus Christ and he sees um, in some symbolic language trying to describe to us using earthly um, examples to try to depict something that was heavenly. And so what he's seeing Jesus is in his multifacetedness facetness and his, um, him being multidimensional. He is different no matter how you look at him. And so this is the subject that we are going to endeavor to deal with in this particular Bible class to show you that Jesus in every book of the Bible, he is something different. But nevertheless, he is in every book of the Bible and it proves that the book was written of him to do the will of God. Can the church say amen? Now, we are left off in the book of Leviticus where we describe to you that Jesus was the high priest. And then we gave you a New Testament scripture to explain to you the fact that not only was he the high priest in the Old Testament, or um, if I could say it like this, that Aaron was a type of Jesus, the high priest to come. And Jesus fulfilled that in as much as he came and he was a high priest after the order of Melchizedek without beginning of days nor end of life. Can the church say amen? And he entered in, uh, Brother Nick, once into the holy place or heaven with the sacrifice of himself and, etern and accomplish, as it were, in the heavens eternal redemption for the human family and for all that would come unto him through the New Testament plan of salvation. In the church say amen. So now let's go to the book of Numbers, and I'm going to try to move as quickly as I can, saints, because we have a lot of scripture to get to. So let's go now to the book of Numbers, chapter number 14, and verses 14 is what we want. Praise the Lord. Book of Numbers. Chapter 14, and we're interested in verses 14. I hear pages turning, so I'm going to be patient. When they were in the wilderness, saints, they were not alone. They had God with them. Can the church say amen? Jesus was in the wilderness with them, not in his flesh, but as the eternal God. Can the church say amen? Read here verses 14. Read with me. And they would tell it to the inhabitants of this land. For they have heard that thou, uh, that thou, Lord, art among his people. Now he was among his people. Can the church say amen? He is among his people today. But let's going to see. It. Now we're going to see how he was among them. Read. That thou... Lord art seen face to face and that thy cloud standeth over them and that thou goest before them by day time and a pillar of cloud and by night and a pillar of fire so what was Jesus with them he was a pillar of cloud by day and he was a pillar of fire by night he was also a rock that followed them can the church say amen? So in the book of Numbers, Jesus is a pillar of cloud by day, and he is a pillar of fire by night. When they cried unto him, he was there with them. Now this pillar of cloud simply represented Sister Why needed the presence of God with the people. Praise the Lord. It led them. And when the, the scripture tells us, Sister Juanita, when the, um, when the cloud would lift up off of the tabernacle, it, it signified to them that it was time for them to move. The priests would come, um, and they would, uh, those that had the order to disassemble the tabernacle, praise the Lord, the certain families, they would disassemble it, because each family had a specific job to do in erecting, 
and disassembling the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a type of our Lord and Savior who? Jesus Christ. So they would disassemble it, praise the Lord, and, when the and they would follow the cloud. And when the cloud stopped, whether it be by day or by night, what, what would they do? They will erect it, praise the Lord. And this all signified that Jesus was in spirit form in presence with the people. Can the church say amen? This is what this all signified. Can the church say amen? It showed the fact that Jesus was with his people. He was helping them. He was guiding them. He was strengthening them. He was giving them the help that they need. Can the church say amen? Now let's go to the New Testament to prove that fact. Can the church say praise the Lord? Verses numbers, chapter number 10, verses number 4 of the book of 1 Corinthians. This is an example to us. Can the church say amen? Verses numbers 1 through 4 is what we're interested in. Like we just said, the presence of God was with the people of God. Isn't that right? And, and the writer here, um, Paul, is going to explain that to us, what was with them. Let's read here. Moreover, brethren, I would not have you ignorant to, uh, excuse me, be ignorant how that all your fathers were under the cloud. What cloud was that? The pillar of cloud by day. Read. And passed through the, through the sea. That would be the Red Sea. Can the church say amen? And what happened when they were under the cloud and they went through the sea? Read. And they were all baptized under Moses in the cloud. That term Moses simply means they were baptized under the law. Read. And what? Uh, it says in the cloud and in the sea. So what was with them? The presence of God. The presence of God. No, chapter um, 10. Yes. They were with the people. God was with the people in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Read. And did what? All eat the same Spiritual meat, mm-hmm, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drunk of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was who? Christ. He was as a spiritual rock. He's, a, as we say, sing the song, he's a rock in what? A weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Can the church say amen? He was also a rock that followed them. When they cried out for thirst, he became a rock that issued water out. And that, no doubt, signified the fact that he was living water. He was also spiritual meat. He was bread from heaven. Can the church say amen? Can't you see he's everywhere? Can the church say hallelujah? So let's now, let's move on from here. Let's go to the book of Deuteronomy. And let's gonna, we're going to show you what Jesus was in the book of Deuteronomy. Verses, chapter number nine, uh, 18, verses 18. In the church, say amen. We're going to cover a lot of scripture today because we certainly have much to get to. Eighteen and eighteen is what we want. Praise the Lord. Can the church say amen? Let's read here. I will raise up. Now this is Moses. Excuse me, I'm sorry to jump ahead. But this is Moses giving them the law the second time. The term De Deuteronomy starts with do, which means to. It is the second rehearsing of the law 40 years prior to him giving it to them um, in the book of Exodus. This is Moses in his old age reminding the children of God as to one that was going to come. There was someone coming. This is a prophecy, P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y, to foretell that somebody was coming. Let's keep reading. From among, um, he said, from among their brethren, 
like unto me. This one that was coming was going to be a prophet like unto who? Me. Or who is the me? It was Moses. Read. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that will, uh, uh, excuse me, that I shall command. This prophet that was like unto Moses is Jesus Christ that was going to come. And I'm going to show you that in the New Testament. Let's go now to the book of Acts chapter number 3 verse 22. There was one that was coming. He was greater than Moses. Praise God. And Moses was a type of this prophet that was coming. And that prophet is our Lord and Savior who? Jesus Christ. So in the book of Deuteronomy, he's a prophet like unto Moses. That God put his words in his mouth and he fulfilled the plan of God in its entirety. Three and 22 is what we want here. In the church say hallelujah. Let's look at what Luke records here concerning this prophet that showed up. This was the fulfillment, no doubt, when Jesus came. Read here. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your, shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, because Jesus was of his brethren. He was a root out of dry ground. The dry ground was Israel, according to the book of Isaiah, chapter number uh, 53, verse 1. He gave them life, but as according to the flesh, he came up out of them. But when he came up out of them, he gave them life. Can the church say, church say amen? Mm -hmm. Which, let me stop, what did I stop at? Like unto me, him shall ye hear in what all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. This prophet that was like unto Moses was our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that they were supposed to hear. And when they heard him, if and when they heard him, he gave them life. If they rejected him, they, re they rejected life. Because the Bible said he came unto his own, and his own received them not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So life came through who? This prophet. Can the church say amen? The Bible said the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth have come by who? Jesus Christ. So in the book of Deuteronomy, Jesus is a prophet like unto Moses. One of the scriptures to prove that point, let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 3. And we want verses numbers 1 here. Hebrews 3 and 1. The Hebrew writer here draws an analogy between Moses and Jesus and makes the point that this Jesus was more faithful than Moses. Why? Because he was the true prophet to come, or I wouldn't say true prophet, but he was the prophet that would fulfill the prophecy of him coming and being like unto Moses. Verses numbers three, verses numbers one, are we there? Wherefore, holy brethren, Partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ, who was more faithful than him, uh, excuse me, who was uh, faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all of his house. Now, this Jesus was more faithful than Moses. Can the church say amen? Why? Because he was a prophet like unto Moses that would come. Praise the Lord. And what did he bring? The Bible said in one place he brought healing in his wings. He brought life because he was life eternal. So what was Jesus in the book of Deuteronomy? He was a prophet like unto Moses. And everyone that hears him receives life. Can the church say amen? What Moses could not do through the law. God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Now let's go to the book of Joshua. Somebody say Joshua. Somebody say he's a captain. Can the church say amen? That means he's in charge of the army. Can the church say hallelujah? All right, let's read here. Joshua chapter number five. Jesus is 
the captain of our salvation. Can the church say hallelujah? Do you love him today? I love him too. I don't know what I would do without him. Deuteronomy, I mean, Joshua chapter 5. Can the church say amen? This is Joshua asking a question. And he gets a response. This is a theophanies, or God in a physical form. That's speaking back to Joshua and letting him know who's in charge. Can the church say amen? Verses number 13, read. Are we there? Chapter 5, 13, read. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. This man is God. You hear what I'm telling you? This is God manifest in flesh. Read. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversary? Mm -hmm. Read. And he said, Nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord, I am, I am, uh, excuse me, I am I now come, excuse me. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship. Now he's worshiping the captain or he's worshiping God. Can the church say amen? So what basically the point here is that God will fight your battles because he's the captain. Can the church say amen? Who fought the battle for the children of Israel? God did. There's another scripture he fought there. The Bible talked about how he fought for them in the day of battle. Why? Because Jesus is the captain of our salvation. And I'm going to show you that scripture in the book of Hebrews. He was the captain of the Lord's host. He's the captain of our salvation. Can the church say amen? All right. And he said unto him, what uh, saith my Lord unto his servant? Read. Read here, verse 15. This is our verse we wanted. And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, loose thy foot, uh, excuse me, thy shoes, from off thy feet. Now, what happened when Moses stood on the mountain? I think it was Mount Sinai. When he, or Hebron, I can't remember exactly. When he stood on the mountain by the burning bush, who spoke to him? And what did God tell him to do? Take the shoes off of your feet. What is the angel, what is the uh, captain of the Lord's host telling him to do? Take off. This is the same God. He showed up in a burning bush. To Moses. Now he's showing up in, as the captain of the Lord's host to what? Joshua. It's saying, I'm in charge, Joshua. You let me do the fighting. Because the battle is what? Mine. Can the church say amen? God will fight our battle, saints. If we hold our peace and let the Lord fight our battles. Because as I've said before in previous Bible classes, we are not fighting with flesh and blood. But we're fighting against principalities, powers the rulers of darkness in high places when you are engaging with people in these social media outlets and you're talking to people on your job and you're dealing with these individuals that um, are not saved that refuse to hear the gospel that we witness to we try to help that we try to show the love of God to what you're actually uh, dealing with is that you you are actually engaging with spirits just like when they come to us they are engaging with the Spirit of God at, as it, Sister Kay, operates out of his children. If we be under the influence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The same thing happens on the flip side of the coin when you're dealing with individuals that refuse to hear the gospel. And we might as well understand that this is what we're dealing with. And do not use natural tactics and earthly means of warfare against them. You pray. You witness to them. You show them the love of God. And if they reject truth, you shake the dust off of your feet as it was the custom of the apostles and you move on. And you do not cast your pearls before, as, as it were, swine. The pearls is the gospel. How beautiful are the feet of them that carry the gospel? That preach the gospel, excuse me. When we carry the gospel to people, it is a beautiful thing. When people reject it, you leave them be. 
because the words that you speak to them, either it will be a means of justifying them in judgment if they obey, or it will it would be a means of justifying God in his judgment for their disobedience. Can the church say amen? As I've said to the church before, the only God that people will see is the God that is in his people. Jesus is no longer walking the face of the earth, but he does walk in his tabernacle, tabernacles, in his houses of clay, in his temples, in his mansions, in his ivory palaces. He walks in us. So when people say, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind, think about it for a minute, because the only mind that I'm supposed to have is what? The mind of Christ. And if I'm not giving them God's mind, I need to think about it for a minute. Can the church say amen? Because the, let me tell you something. I, this is not a part of our Bible class, but I'm just going to give this to you. You see, what is happening today, saints, is that people are becoming more opinionated as time goes on. The Twitter universe, the Facebook universe, the MySpace, they ain't got MySpace no more. That's old, isn't it? But whatever this, uh, my, my wife was telling me that there was a man who came to uh, Excel Academy to, to give to the children the dangers of social media. And she said that he brought up a, probably around 28 or so social media sites. And he was trying to explain the danger in many of these sites as it pertains to how they access our children. And if we are not aware of it, our children can be uh, victimized by predatory individuals. Because you believe you me, this as God can use these things to benefit his kingdom, so does the enemy use it to benefit his kingdom. And the church say, man, he does it. Praise the Lord. And so what is happening now is that people are becoming so opinionated every time there's an issue that comes in, in the world, everybody feels like they need to pick up their, their phones and they need to comment on it. I wonder when people are going to start commenting about, him, about telling people the truth of the gospel. Why don't we comment on that? Why don't we tweet that? Okay. Praise the Lord. Why don't we Facebook, Facebook that? Praise the Lord. Instead of Facebooking your opinion about everything, when my opinion is supposed to be about God, I tell people all the time, I don't have time for that. What do you think about that, Pastor? Brother, I don't have time to waste trying to change people who are not going to make the rapture anyway, mind about what they should be doing. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you want to hear the truth, come and hear it. The truth is in the earth, but one of these days it's going to be gone. And if we're not giving people the truth, we're wasting our time. Praise the Lord. We, we are playing into a system of the world, the system of the world that does not uh, benefit us at all. In the church, amen. And what you see when you look at these individuals and all of their posts and their tweets, you are seeing what is in their heart. In the church, amen. Somebody say, Pastor, get off your soapbox. I'm trying to today. But this is the way it is. Can the church say amen? We need to tell our children, you need to stop this foolishness. Praise the Lord. Stop this foolishness and start walking with God in the simplicity of Christ. If you're going to use your technological apparatuses, use them right. Use them to glorify God. Don't use them to look stupid. Don't use them to put your body all out there because once it's out there, it's out there. Don't use it to tweet stuff that means absolutely nothing because you can't live it down because employers can get all of this stuff. Do you not know that employers, employers use these things to hire and to fire people? People are losing their jobs. And we're becoming a, a society that is so, how can I say, sensitive to what everybody says. You can't say this. I, let me give you a minute. You can't say that. Praise the Lord, because it's going to hurt somebody's feelings. If you're telling people the truth, so what? Did, let me tell you something about Jesus. Jesus was not concerned about making people happy. He was concerned about giving them the truth. He called Herod a fox. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He said, you have been sleeping with your, with your brother's wife. 
You, you think Jesus was concerned about hurting his feelings? No. He was trying to get him to repent. Hey, praise the Lord. So if you tell the people the truth, don't worry about that. But just don't be up there talking a bunch of foolishness. Give people the truth and let God be true and every man a liar. Speak the truth. People, hallelujah. Let me stop. I got to get back on my subject. All right. Mm -hmm. So this is what he tells him as we close this here. It says, whereunto thou standest on what holy ground? So this, no doubt, was a theophanies or God in a physical form um, manifesting himself to Joshua as the captain of the Lord's hosts, the host of heaven. He was the captain or he was in charge of the armies of heaven. This is, exact, this is God manifest in flesh. Let us see what our brother um, or our Hebrew writer writes about here. Let's go now to Hebrews as we move on because you know me, I talk too much. Hebrews chapter number... Two. Hebrews chapter number 2 verse 10 is what we want. 2 and 10 is what we want. That was a side note, praise the Lord, because I'm very passionate about that subject, because this is what's destroying people today, their inability to be spiritual, and their mindset about the carnal things of this world that absolutely will do nothing for you but kill you. Can the church say amen? All right, verses numbers 10, he says, for it, for it became him that him is Jesus, read, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and what? Bringing many sons. These many sons that he's speaking of here, the Hebrew writer, is the church. Read. Unto glory. This is what he's trying to do. This is what he's going to do because this is one of the six things that work together for our good. Is the bringing to us in glory, bringing us to glory, or glorifying us. Can the church say Amen. This is what he's going to do. Read. To make the captain of what? What is he? The captain of our salvation. So what is he in the book of Joshua? He's the captain of our salvation. Because if this captain in Joshua's day did not show up, then they would have been defeated. See, it wasn't that Joshua marched around the city seven times. It wasn't that Joshua and, uh, and, and the people of Israel shouted. It was that the captain of the Lord's host was there and they obeyed the word of God because they could have walked around the city a hundred times. But if Jesus wasn't there, it wasn't going to happen. Because remember what happened when they sent the 12 spies, if memory serves me correct, into, um, um, as it were, the promised land, the spy of the land. They said, Brother Nick, that we be as grasshoppers in their sight. Ten of them came back and gave an evil report. Only two gave a good report. Can the church say amen? Joshua and Caleb were the only ones that gave a good report. Can the church say amen? I saw that. God bless you. Yeah, I know you were thinking about that. Yep, two of them gave a good report. But ten of them gave an evil report. And what did God do? He had them walk around in the wilderness for 40 years. A year for a day. They were in the, prom they were in the promised land for 40 days. They walked around in the wilderness for 40 years. Can the church say amen? All because they didn't believe the word of God. Can the church say praise the Lord? So what is, what the, what is the point here? The point is that he is the captain of our salvation. So in the book of, jo uh, the book of Joshua, what is Jesus? He's the captain of your salvation. He is in charge. Can the church say hallelujah? He's got it all in his, somebody say, his hands. Now let's move on to the book of Judges. Can the church say amen? Judges has to do with the 13 judges that were sent as a 
saviors, if I can say that, and deliverers of the children of Israel prior to um, them receiving a king, which, which Jesus, God was their king, but prior to the kings and after the death of Joshua, Caleb, and those that saw the promises of God on the other side of the flood and were eyewitnesses of his glory. They had 13 judges, actually 15 in total, because you can count, um, if memory serves me correct, you can count Samuel as a judge also. But this book contains 13 judges. But Jesus is what? The true judge. Amen. And what? The true lawgiver. Can the church say amen? Now let's go to the book of uh, Judges. Judges, chapter number three. So he's a judge and he's a lawgiver. Praise the Lord. Why? Because the law belongs to him. I'll give you this scripture here as an example to show you that they had judges. And the judges were there as deliverers. Because after Joshua and the fathers had died, Israel backslid. And they fell into the hands of the enemies, and they would cry out to God, and he would send a deliverer. That, that judge would judge them for approximate time that God had given him the judgment to be over the children of Israel. And then once they died, once they died, in many cases, Israel would do the same thing. They would backslide. And then they would cry out to God, and he would send them another judge. And so forth and so on. And this went on for 413 years that they had judges. Can the church say amen? But thanks be to God, a true judge showed up. Amen. Our judge and our lawgiver, which is who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. They were seeking judgment, but, they were, but they, did, they were not seeking, the, as it were, the true judgment of God as they ought to. Can the church say amen? And they were seeking the order of God, they would have found it. All they had to do was get themselves back in line according to the law as God had given it, given it unto them, and they could have had the judgments of God to govern their lives because they'd already had the Ten Commandments and the 613 uh, ordinances of worship. Praise the Lord. But in many cases, the children of Israel were so out of line to the point where they were throwing away the judgments of God. And whenever they got in trouble, and this is what happens to us today. When we get in trouble, we cry to God, and the Lord shows up and helps us. And then when we get out of it, we drive past the church and hunk our horns on Sunday morning. Praise the Lord. All right? I'm just kidding there. But let's read here, verses numbers 9. Are we there? 3 and 9. This, if memory serves me correct, this is the first judge of Israel. Let's go, before we read that, let's go over to verses 10, I mean, excuse me, verses, um, chapters 2, verse 10, starting with verses 8, to make the point of the condition of Israel after the fathers fell asleep, and how God sent them these judges to help them. This is the reason why he did this, was because of their condition. Let's read verses numbers 8 here. And Joshua, the son of Nun... The servant of the Lord died, being a hundred and ten years old, and they buried him in the border of his inheritance. Timoth, I can't pronounce that word. Okay, in um, the Mount of Ephraim, read on the north side of the hill, uh, Gaish. All right, read. And also all the generation that were gathered unto their fathers, and they arose. Now this is another generation or another group of the children of the fathers. And you're going to see exactly what happens. Now there was apparently a gulf betwixt them, inasmuch as they didn't receive what the fathers had before them. This is the reason why it's important for us to receive the teachings of our fathers. Why? Because if we don't receive the teachings of our fathers and we were not eyewitnesses of that which God gave to them, then we can lose the legacy that God desired for us to have. And this begun the constant up and down slide of the children of Israel. 
And for 413 years, they were under the rule of judges, but they were constantly in and out of the good graces of God based upon the fact that there was another generation that did not know God as the fathers did. And we have young men today that tell us, well, we need to forget about what the fathers did and we need to go in another direction. Well, I tell people like this, if you forget about those that labored in Christ for you, somebody going to forget about you one day. Praise the Lord. Somebody going to rain on your parade and you're going to deserve every minute of it. And I tell these young brothers right now, if they'll listen, if you want to throw away the doctrine that we have received, the legacy of holiness and the truth that God has allowed our fathers to labor in for us, you ain't going to have nothing to stand on. Because the order of God is that the blessing always comes through what? The fathers. I could teach a Bible study on that to show you that Abraham blessed his son. Isaac blessed his son. Jacob blessed his sons. Can the church say amen? This is the way it works. The law of the patriarchs, the law in the Old Testament, was that the father, as he aged, when it was time for him to leave, he would call his firstborn son in, and he would pass the blessing down to him. And the Bible said a wise man led up a heritage for his children's children. What is our heritage now? Our heritage now that we give our children is the example of holiness that we leave before them. And raising them up in the way of God. Raising them up in the truth of God so that they can understand what God's will is. That's what we give them today. Other than maybe the natural inheritance that we give them as far as our money, uh, whatever our houses, whatever you want to do for your children, that's your business. But the point I'm saying is that the heritage that God is concerned about is have you raised them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord? Amen. Can the church say amen? Okay, oh, praise the Lord. So let's read here. And all the generations were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation of them, of the fathers, which what? Knew not the Lord. Now this started, as it were, the institution of the judges that would judge Israel and the lawgivers that would judge Israel for 413 years. But thanks be to God that Jesus Christ came and became the true lawgiver, the true judge, praise God, that brought judgment and righteousness to his children. Let's keep reading here. We're almost done. Where did I, where did I stop at? Knew not, knew not the Lord, nor the works which uh, he had done for Israel. They knew not the Lord, nor the works which he had done for Israel, because the oral tradition of passing down the legacy of truth had not been kept. Praise the Lord. We need an oral tradition within the apostolic movement of teaching this to our children. Teach them the ways. Teach them the traditions. Teach them the law so they will know what to do and how to do. So they won't be going out here fellowshipping with these demon-possessed people and bringing all this foolishness in our churches. Try, and we're trying to figure out how, is that child okay? Is he okay? Is he all right? Uh, now, and all of this stuff, praise the Lord, into our churches and calling it apostolic. Some of this stuff ain't apostolic. It's demon-possessed. In the church, say amen. Hallelujah, because we're trying to be like, walk like, talk like the world. This is what happened to them. And what happened? They backslid over and over again. Hallelujah. Now let's, let's go to the New Testament here. No, no, no. Let's go to Isaiah. Can the church say amen? Isaiah 32. Isaiah Chapter 32 and verse 33 and verses 32. 
33 and 30. Um, oh, there is no. Let me see. Oh, 30. I'm sorry. 33 and 22. I'm sorry. Now, who's the Lord? The Lord is Jesus. Can the church say amen? He's the king of kings and what? The Lord of lords. Now, he wasn't known as Jesus here. He was known as Jehovah to the children of Israel. Because the name Jesus means Jehovah has become salvation. So you're not, he's not revealed as Jesus here. He's revealed as Jehovah, but he's Lord. But then in the New Testament, you're going to see that he's Jesus. I'm going to show you that in a minute. All right? The Lord is our what? Judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. So what was Jesus in the Old Testament, in that particular book? He was the lawgiver. Later to be revealed as who? Jesus. Now let's go to the New Testament. Can the church say amen? Verses, chapter number Timothy. I didn't give you the chapter. 2 Timothy chapter uh, 4 verse 1. I'm getting excited. I need to slow down, don't I? Second Timothy chapter four, verse one. To make the fact, to make the point that Jesus is the judge. We're about done here today. Are we there? Verses numbers one. He says, I charge thee bef therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, because he because the Lord and God are one and the same. He is the Lord, he is God and the Lord Jesus Christ, or even the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, read. Who shall what? Judge the what? Quick and the dead at what? At his appearance and his kingdom. So what is he? He's the judge. Can the church say amen? He's the lawgiver. Hallelujah. The law issued out of his mouth. One scripture said that when he taught, he, he taught with one having authority and not as a scribe because he was the word manifest in flesh. Praise the Lord. He was God, the lawgiver before them, and he had the authority to interpretate or to interpret his own law to them as he talked to them. So I just wanted to make the point here that Jesus is what? The judge and the lawgiver in the book of Judges. Now let's go to Ruth. This is going to take me a long time to get through this. Can the church say praise the Lord? Somebody say he's our kinsman redeemer. This is what the book of Ruth deals with. Jesus, our kinsman redeemer. Boaz was a type of Jesus from this respect that he was the next of kin. Can the church say amen? Ruth, the book of Ruth. Can the church say praise the Lord? Ruth, uh, what verse do I want here? Let me see. I don't think I write. I didn't write a verse down here. Yes, it's right after Judges. Ruth, chapter two, verses one. He is our kinsman redeemer, our next of kin, which is Jesus Christ who came to redeem us. That's what this is because when Naomi lost her two sons, one of her daughters went back into her land. The other one, which was Ruth, said, wherever you go, I'll go. Where you die, I die. Where you die I'll die. Your God shall be my God. Your people shall be my people. Can the church say amen? And when she got there, Naomi, Naomi her Mother-in-law told her what to do. Boaz was the next of kin. He was a type of Christ from this respect, that he was the next one that was able to redeem them. Because in that day, no doubt, a woman could not work. It wasn't like you can go down to go get a job in those days. You had to depend on your son if your, father, if, if your husband died. In the church, say amen. If um, the husband died and you didn't have a son, 
Your, if your father so happened to be alive, you can go back to your father's house. If you couldn't do that, the, the only other option is for a woman in that day to be either a beggar or a prostitute. Those were the way, that's what, that was the way that it was in that day. But thanks be to God that God used Boaz as a type of Christ to show us what Jesus would do when he would redeem us as our next of kin. Can the church say amen? Verses numbers one here. Are we there? Naomi made, are we there? Chapter two, Ruth. Are we there? Let's read. And Naomi had a kinsman of her, uh, of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, mm -hmm. and his name was what? Boaz. Boaz was a type of Christ. He was a wealthy man. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And what did, what did Naomi tell her to do? He said, you go and glean in his field. Go on the outer, on the outer corners, because this was a part of the law. They could do this. Praise the Lord. She told him how to get his attention. Submit herself. Praise the Lord. And what, what happened? She was redeemed. Now note with me here, Naomi was a Gentile. She was not a Jew. What did God do when he came in the person of Jesus Christ? He redeemed the Gentiles. He was our next of kin or our kinsman redeemer to redeem, or redeem us back to himself. Can the church say praise the Lord? So what is Jesus here? He's your kinsman redeemer. Now let's go to New Testament to prove that. New Testament, let's go to Hebrews chapter number 2, verses 11 through 14. This is where we'll end up today. We're not going to get as far as I thought we, we could get, so I may be teaching this for probably six months. I don't even know. Praise the Lord. I don't know how many notes you're going to have on this particular subject, but somebody say he's everywhere. Now, I could simply rattle off these scriptures and tell you to go study them, but we're trying to make points as we move along. And whenever you teach this way, it takes a lot of time because you have to give a lot of detail. And detail takes time. So this will actually be our last verse because I have a meeting after my Bible class today. So I'm going to try to make a quick point on this part of our Bible class as Jesus, as our kinsman redeemer, he redeemed us. That's what the theme of this book is. It is redemption. Jesus um, has become our near kinsman to redeem us because we could not do it ourselves. Ruth could not do it herself because she was in a land that she had no relatives. She had no one to take care of her. She was under the custom of the Jews. She couldn't work. But what did God do? He redeemed her. Praise the Lord. What is God doing with the church? He's redeemed. He's redeeming us. He has redeemed us out of the world. He is continuing the work of redemption through the church. He is making us more like himself as we submit ourselves to the law of God. Why? Because he is our kinsman redeemer. All right. What verse did I say? Let's start with verses 11. He says, for both he that, sanctif uh, uh, that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are of one. Mm -hmm. Which cause, read with me, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now this is what, speaking of him, he's not ashamed to call us brethren because he sanctified us. Read, saying, I will declare my name unto my brother. Now this is what he's done for us. In as much as that we, as one writer said, we were far off. We have been made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. He's called us, Brother Nick, to come and build in the temple of the Lord. He's not ashamed to call us brothers, brethren because he is our next of kin. He has made us acceptable, the church, his bride, acceptable in the beloved. Can the church say amen? Read here. In the midst of the church... Read, will I sing praises unto thee, and again, I will put my trust in him, that is Jesus, and again, behold, I, uh, I am the children which God has given me. Can the church say amen? Who did, he give, who did God give 
the children to? He gave it to himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Can the church say amen? We are the children of God. He puts trust in himself that he can get the job done because he's in the church. We're in him. He's working on us to make us into what he wants us to be. Let's keep reading here, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh and blood, read, he also partook likewise, uh, he also took likewise, took part of the same, that through death he might destroy uh, what? Him that had power over death, that is Satan. So what God did through the redemptive process, he became our next of kin, and now we are his brethren. Can the church say amen? The Bible said that we are many brethren in one place. Why? Because he had a plan to bring us out. And what God did throughout the Old Testament, if you pay attention, in these books, it reveals, or in the Bible, excuse me, it reveals the central theme of the scripture. That is for God to redeem his people. Most of what is in the Bible is to the church. There's only one element in the Bible that is to the world. That is the redemptive element calling them out of darkness into the, his marvelous light. But all of the rest of the scripture, Sister Kay, is to the church. This is the reason why I tell people it is a, it is a, a, a futile argument to try to get people to understand the revelation, revelatory things of God. Because those things are only revealed to us. They can't see it. Praise the Lord. They can't see it until they're born a son. Can the church say amen? amen. They can't understand the oneness of the God and in Christ. They can't understand the hidden mysteries of God. Why? Because they haven't been born again. But if they get born again, God can illuminate their eyes and show them what his will is. So this, this Bible study here is dealing with the revelatory things of God to show to us that are in him what Jesus is in the word of God. Now, he's many things, and we're just scratching the surface. But he represents these things in the word of God for the sole purpose, as it pertains to this particular Bible study, to redeem. Because most of these titles that you see in has to do with him drawing men to himself. He's a true prophet. He's the seed of the woman. He is the um, he is the Passover lamb. He's a pillar cloud by day, pillar fire by night. He's the captain of our salvation. He's our kinsman redeemer. He's our judge and lawgiver. Why is he all these things? Because he's trying to what? Save us. And the church say amen. So people talk about what, what, is the church, what is the church all about? Honey, the church is about salvation. That's all it's about. Everything we learn in the church is to make us ready to see Jesus. And people tell me, I'm, I'm looking to see Barack Obama. I, don't, I ain't looking to see Barack Obama. I'm looking to see Jesus Christ. Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, any of them guys, I'm looking to see Jesus. Because the Bible said of the increase of his kingdom, there shall be no end. <laughs> you see, their, their rule will, will start and stop. But when Jesus start ruling, which he is ruling, because he's allowing these individuals to do what they do, when he gets his kingdom set up, Bishop, and he brings down man's kingdom, the kingdoms of this world, the Bible said the kingdoms of man have become the kingdoms of our Lord. That shall be fulfilled one day. And when that happens, nobody is going to be able to do anything about it. NATO... The United Kingdom, what they call the European Union, isn't what they call it over there? Can the church say amen? Nobody's going to do anything about it, so I'm waiting for Jesus to come. Can the church say amen? Anybody have any questions? Yes.